Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Marit Kapla's Osobel, Voices from a Swedish Village, translated from the Swedish by Peter Graves. And this book was published in 2021. As many of you know, I like maximalism a lot. I really like dense and baroque prose styles and long and winding sentences. I say that most books I read are in that form, but I also really like minimalism. And in fact, some of my favorite poets are minimalists. Olaf H. Hoige, Tarje Vesos, and some of my favorite pro stylists are also minimalists. Jan Fosse comes to mind. I'm realizing that these are all Norwegians. But what I really like is the contrast between these two forms. I'm not a reader who has one style that they really love and then never steer outside of that small lane. So in the midst of re reading a couple maximalist works, namely Solenoid by Mircea Cartarescu and Lady Joker by Karu Takamura, I decided to pick up Possible. Something about the mystical subtitle, Voices from a Swedish Village, really drew me in, though when I began I had no expectations, I had no idea what the book was even about. But the other night I just couldn't pick up Solenoid. As good as it is, after a long day of doing research all day, I just didn't have it in me to dive into his maximalist and surrealist uh, novel. So I picked up Ossible, and two hours went by. This book just creates the most amazing meditative mode as you're swept up into the rhythm of these stories that these completely ordinary people tell. I adored this book. I love what it sets out to do, and I love even more the execution. Osable is by Marit Kapla, but it's also kind of not. See, this book is in many ways a communal book, where Kapla is less of an author in how we traditionally understand the word author, and more of a collector and editor. The conceit of this book is that Kapla went to this small village of Osobel and interviewed all of its remaining citizens. There were only like 40 people living there. And what this book is then is their words, their stories. So on each page at the bottom lists the name of the speaker and the year that they were born and the year that they died, if applicable. The speakers aren't introduced. We know nothing about them. We have no context for them or the village, the town of Osobel itself, which means that we're forced to approach them just based on their words alone. And what Kapla does is simply put their words into verse and into a specific order in this book. Whether she edited these stories any more than that is really anyone's guess, though theoretically what we're getting are the unadulterated words, the unadulterated stories of these 40 villagers of this small town in Sweden. And this might not sound like it makes for a compelling literature, but I promise you it does. Each of these storytellers, that's what I'll call them, create their own rhythm, and all Kapla does is use the natural rhythm created by their words, by their sentences, to structure it into verse. But as you read, it's really just the words and the natural syntax that they create that gives it rhythm. It reminded me a lot of Patrick uh, McCabe's Pogue Mahone, which also just uses that natural rhythm that good oral storytellers create. The poetry of spoken word, the poetry of an oral story. In the opening pages, each page is spoken by a different person. Though later in the book we do get much more substantive stories from each of these speakers and it becomes a, a lot less fragmentary. But let me just read the opening pages of this book just so you get a sense of the individual rhythms that each storyteller um, is able to create. Let me tell you something. My life has been like Vermland, mountains and valleys. It's had its ups and its downs. We moved here with everything we owned. Me and a mate came in the lorry and Tina and the children in the ordinary car. It was two or three degrees below zero when we arrived at the house. It was at the end of September, or the beginning of October, just before the start of the elk hunting season. The Milky Way lay like a starry barrier across the sky. I had this buzz in my ears all the time. Can't you hear it too? I said and went outside where our electric meter was on a pole with a load of overhead wires and the like. Then eventually I realized that what I was hearing was silence something I hadn't heard for 20 years in Stockholm. I think you appreciate it more the longer you've been away. I can see there are days when it's magnificent, but otherwise, for me, it's just a bloody valley, sort of. Looking out of the upstairs window at Klarostrand, I saw a salmon swimming just below the surface. 
Each storyteller really does have a noticeable voice that we return to later in the book. But this fragmentary opening where, again, we just get these small snippets from each of these storytellers is really important because it creates a series of disconnected points, which will, as we continue to read and learn more about each of these storytellers, will begin to form into a constellation. These individual stories slowly transform into a recognizable, cohesive community. And their voices become a single ensemble, full of individual parts but working together. Ossipal is an idyllic village in a lot of ways, in the ways that we often idealize small towns, in, especially in Nordic countries. They are these perfect and harmonious and self-sufficient communities, in direct contrast to the chaos of the big cities. But of course, this really isn't the case, and Ossibel has all sorts of problems. It's isolated, all of the industry that used to be there has left, and so there are few jobs, etc. One storyteller, Lotzen Gustafsson, says at one point, Living here is wonderful. That's not the problem. The problem is the logistics. Most of these storytellers talk about the changing world in Ossible. So many of the speakers are over the age of 60. Many are over the age of 80. And so they've witnessed these drastic changes in the village around them and in the world around them, right? Many of them were born before World War II broke out. They lost jobs as industries have changed. They've lost friends and families who have migrated south and uh, east to the bigger cities to find jobs. The forest around them has changed. And of course, they've lost friends and loved ones to death. And so they're living with all of this loss, as we all live with loss, but it's especially palpable in this small town because, well, it's such a small village. One small missing piece is a lot more noticeable on this scale. The village of Ossible is itself dying. There aren't many inhabitants left, and Marie de Kapla had, had to only interview 40 people, and that was all the people in the town. And so we're really left wondering if this village is going to exist in 10, 20, 50 years? Probably not. So many of these stories are about loss, and in that way these losses are kind of unlost. As our narrators conjure up their lost loved ones and make their stories a, an essential part of their own stories. And they fill in these voids, these losses, with stories. And of course it should be said, sadly, a lot of these storytellers have died since their stories were collected. Many of them passed away in 2020 or 2021. There's a famous bridge in Ossibol that has been shut down for many years. I say famous. They're very proud of it though. It looks like a rather unassuming bridge to me. But the district council has shut it down a couple years ago because it needs renovating and of course it's dangerous. And so there's this constant debate between all of these villagers of whether they should destroy it and rebuild it from scratch, whether they should just destroy it and not build anything else, or whether they should renovate it. And everyone is so concerned with it. I would say most speakers in this book bring up the bridge at some point or another. And so there is this recurring image of this dilapidated bridge, which, you know, I'm an English teacher. A bridge is a really easy symbol to read. And this one really is this symbol of this old world. And it stands in its decaying state and asks the villagers of Ossible, what do you do with the past? especially the past that isn't glamorous, but rather just mundane and functional. Do we destroy it and start over? Do we fix it? Do we rebuild it in a new way? Or do we just leave it and move on and away from it? How do we move forward without leaving the past behind? It seems to me that almost every single storyteller in this book meditates on those questions, especially as, again, a lot of them are quite old, and so they're dealing with a shifting world one that threatens to leave the world that they knew, the world that they lived in, behind. The stories in here are messy, and it's a very weird sensation reading them because they're very easy to follow even if you don't actually know what's going on or who's, or who's being referenced. They bring up people and places with whom you're completely unfamiliar, but that doesn't get in the way. It reminded me a lot, actually, of how my grandparents tell stories and how they would always tell stories about these people that I don't know. Perhaps the family that used to live next door 40 years ago. These stories, both my grandparents' stories and the stories here in this book, are almost always connected to places. And through places, they're connected to people. But they talk about these people and places as if 
I'm familiar with them. And even though I'm not familiar with them, by the end of the story, I feel like I am. In Ausable, by the end, these stories about these people and this community in rural Sweden doesn't feel unfamiliar at all. In fact, it feels very, very familiar. And the way that these oral storytellers achieve this is by peeling back any sense of artifice, by peeling back any type of construction. And what we're left with is just life, our stories of life, pure and simple. The orality of these stories really emphasize their fleeting temporality, though of course this is negated by the creation of a book like this, but they still retain that temporality because the speaker is lost to us even if their story isn't. These stories aren't being copied down and put in a book to be remembered for generations to come, as I don't suspect that this book will be read in generations to come. But in a way it should be, because that's exactly what this book holds in its stories, or just generations of life. There's something just so unadulterated and unadorned about this mode of storytelling that I just absolutely love. It reminds me of the people in my life who are just good oral storytellers, but it also reminds me of many pro stylists that I absolutely adore. Jan Fossa, Per Pertersen, uh, Shel Askeldsen, Tarja Vesos. Again, all Norwegians again, I guess. This is a book that structurally really shouldn't work, but not only does it work, it's one of the most moving books I've read this year. I mean, in less than like 200 words, a man named Bror Andersen, who was born in 1935 and died in 2020, made me tear up as out of nowhere he begins talking about his best friend, a man named Bo Nielsen, who recently passed away. Bror says that life without him will be empty, and he begins telling the reader about their relationship and how they used to just fix odds and ends together, and by doing that they kept each other busy. And I'll just read the last two pages of this, again, very short story. It's o only over the course of like ten pages or so. We'd spent the day before he died adjusting and fixing the grater. During the afternoon, well, he said, that'll be enough for today. So we went off our separate ways as usual, intending to come back to the job the following day. I took a look down there and couldn't see the blue van, which made me think he's probably taking a day off today. Now I just potter about to help the time pass. When he was alive, there was always something for me to go and fetch. I used to go and collect spare parts, or go and pick him up. Let's put it like this. He was the only one I had anything to do with up here. I think he could have been given a few more years. In this book, a village speaks, and we're lucky to be able to listen. This village isn't a perfect community, and Kapla doesn't hide any of these blemishes. A lot of this book is about community, and we hear from immigrants and refugees and people whose families have lived in this area for generations. But, as in any small isolated community, there are some pretty conservative ideas, and Kapla allows them to be voiced. Ausable isn't a utopia, but it's a community struggling to retain being a community. The storytellers talk about politics, about the environment, about the reintroduction of wolves to the area, about the war, about refugees, and about gender relations, and about how all of this is changing so fast and they're just trying to keep up. But for the most part, what they talk about the most is simply the land and the other people in the village. These small things that I, as a reader of literature who likes to grapple with big geopolitical and large socioeconomic issues, often kind of forget about, honestly. Or at least take for granted. Kapla shows that by magnifying in on a small and, in the grand scheme of things, entirely inconsequential village, we're able to see a microcosm of humanity, and thus might be able to better understand what connects us. There's something really existential about this entire project, but it didn't leave me thinking that these kind of communities are a thing of the past and we've moved away from these, though we have in a lot of ways and we're more disconnected now than ever, everyone knows that. But in a lot of ways it just made me hopeful and it made me just really think about these small things which connect us. In a literary world more and more dominated by MFA having writers, a literary world dominated by professional authors. I think it's really worth 
taking the time to read a book that actively goes against this. This isn't to say that writers with MFAs are bad or that professional authors are, are bad. I read a lot of them, obviously. I, I like them a lot. But that when it comes to basic storytelling, ordinary people are amazing oral storytellers. It doesn't take a perfectly executed metaphor or syntactically dense sentences to tell a story. Possible is profound in its simplicity. It's in many ways a litany of the ordinary, a communal chorus of the everyday. There's real poetry in this book, though I won't lie and say that every single story that these storytellers tell are gripping. Occasionally a storyteller just wants to talk about pea soup or how to best process timber. And on one occasion a storyteller stops in the, in, in the middle uh, of telling us how to properly process timber to point out that I don't know if this is actually useful to you, but you're welcome to cut it if you want. But this bagginess, this messiness, this is how people tell stories. These moments are in many ways inessential to the story, but they're essential to the voices. So as we're entering winter, I, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I really recommend reading this book. Dim the lights, put on some soft Nordic ambient music, and let these ordinary people, these completely untrained storytellers, tell you their life story. I think it's worth listening to them. But for now, thanks for watching.